Well, good evening, church. It's good to be with you. Thank the Lord for uh, another beautiful day that he's given us just for health and strength to be able to do this. So just to want to thank him for the week that we've had. Got a lot to pray about tonight. Got, uh, do be much in prayer for uh, Wiley Flynn's family. Uh, Brother Wiley passed away this morning. And uh, um, just pray that to God would just comfort them as only he can. Um, do ask you to continue uh, to pray for uh, Jackie Kitts. Just heard just a matter of moments ago that she was, uh, I believe, in, at the emergency room. So don't know any details, don't know anything other than that, other than a, a request for prayer. So pray for Miss Jackie. Continue to pray for Libby Chambers uh, and and then all of our other sick. There's so many. I ask you to pray for uh, my cousin Bev. Haven't mentioned her in a while. She physically is is recuperating, doing you know progressing uh, from her COVID. Still in the hospital or, or not in the hospital in the in the long term care facility. I think uh, it's beginning to miss home quite a bit. So. Pray for her that God would just give her the patience to continue to do things she needs to do to get her strength back and, and to heal. Pray for the church as we move forward, making decisions concerning, uh, you know, just so many things at the church. You know, the pastor, uh, just the things of the church that we need to be doing. Pray for uh, our nation. Uh, it's uh, every day. It seems like there's there's a new silliness if you would comes up pray that god would just uh, be with the leaders of our nation that he would touch the hearts of of those that that need to know him uh pray for the people of the ukraine it's kind of out of the news a bit but the devastation is widespread and the war is still going in in the ukraine and there's no real end inside it seems so pray for them and then just just pray that tonight as we open god's word that it would touch hearts. It, uh, people would see what Christ did for us. Because we're going to be in the 15th chapter of Mark, verses 33 through 47, concerning the death and the burial of Jesus. But join me as we pray, and then we'll get right on into the Scripture. Yeah. Father, as we come tonight, first of all, I just want to praise you and thank you. God, it seems like that so often all we do is is bring you all of our burdens, bring you all of our cares. God, bring you all of our petitions. Uh, but, Father, we realize that, God, you are great and mighty, and, God, you're worthy of praise. God, no matter what's going on in this world, you are worthy of praise. And, Lord, I pray tonight, Lord, that you be with the Brother Wiley's family in this time. God, give them the strength that they need to, for the days ahead. And, Lord, I pray for... Uh, Miss Jackie, uh, Lord, whatever's going on with her and her health, that you would just touch her and heal her with your miraculous hand of healing. And I pray for, for Libby, uh, Lord, that you just do the same with her. And God, so many others. I pray for Bev, that you would give her the strength that she needs to just, just press on every day. God, just every day, knowing that, God, and I know that she does, that what a miracle you've already performed. And God, what a miracle you're going to perform in her life. And we praise you for that. Lord, thank you for those that have come to know you. Lord, It's uh, Lord. over the last couple of weeks, we've heard of people um, receiving you as their Lord and Savior, and we praise you for that. And Lord, I pray tonight as we open your word, God, that people would hear you and not me. God, that decisions would be made, Lord, would be uh, following you. Uh, Lord, for it's you that we need to be following anyway. God, it's you that we need to be hearing. Lord, I pray for the church. God, give us strength, give us wisdom. More than anything, give us your direction that we need. For all this we'd ask in Christ's glorious name. Amen. Well, we're going to be in, in uh, 15th chapter of Mark, verses 33 through 47. I'm going to read a, quite a bit of scripture and uh, try to be quick about this. But to just ask you just to listen to what the, the Word of God says. It says, And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land, until the ninth hour. <clears throat> and at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he's calling Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. 
Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw it this way, he breathed his last. He said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the younger and of Hoses and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. And when the evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph brought, bought a linen shroud, taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb that he had been cut out of a rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Jose saw where he was laid. And there's so much in this, so, so very much. And, you know, there's six different things that Mark highlights. The darkness that fell, verse 33. Jesus' cry of anguish in 34, 35, and 36. His final cry and then his death in verse 37. The tearing of the temple uh, curtain or veil in uh, 38. The confession of the Roman centurion in 39. And the witness of uh, the women, verses 40 and 41. And, you know, the, these are six things that Mark highlighted, but those are not the only things that happened there. You know, in order to really get the entire picture, you really have to read all four accounts of the crucifixion, the death, and the burial of Jesus. And, you know, because there were seven different sayings, seven different things that Jesus said from the cross. Uh, that uh, and Mark only do, uh, mentions two of the seven, I believe. The first one is Jesus give uh, give forgiveness, where he said, "Father, forgive them." In Luke twenty three thirty four, forgive them for they know not what they do. In he salvation, uh, he spoke about salvation in Luke twenty three forty three after the thief hanging on his. And the thief hanging on the right, when he had confessed Jesus, um, Jesus said, For this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Salvation. Relationship. John nineteen twenty six. when Jesus pointed to his mother and to uh, John and, uh, and declared that John was to take care of her. You know, mother thy son, woman thy son, son thy mother. Uh, abandonment. Mark fifteen thirty four as we just got through reading, uh, where that Jesus said, "My God, My God, why have you forsaken me?" Distress, John nineteen twenty eight, when Jesus cried out in agony and said, "I thirst." Triumph, Mark fifteen thirty seven, uh, when uh, Jesus uh, breathed his last uh, breath, and the centurion soldier saw him. And it says, And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last breath. And some would say, Triumph, that was death. In death came our victory. And then reunion. Luke 23, 46. Uh, and if you look over there in 23, 46, it says, Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last, committing him, returning back to the Father. You know, these are things that when you look at the crucifixion, sometimes we look and we see, you know, the, the brutality of it, which we don't need to forget exactly what he did for us, how he suffered uh, for us. But sometimes when we do that, we forget all of these other things that occurred during that. And, you know, and then we're going to go through and kind of break it down just a little bit here, what we read in, in the book of Mark. And it says, in the sixth hour, darkness fell. You know, about noon, a highly un, um, unlikely time for darkness to fall. It was uh, commemorative 
or mimics the ninth plague of Egypt where darkness fell on the earth for three days. And if you think about this, three hours of darkness follows uh, or, or precedes the death of the firstborn of God. Three days of darkness preceded the death angel coming and killing the firstborn of all uh, in Egypt. So, and this, uh, you know, some scientists, some people try to say, well, it was probably a solar eclipse. It was probably this. Well, seeing as how that it was during a time, then Passover is always during a time of the full moon, it would have been highly unlikely because of the location of it that it would have been no way that it could have been a solar eclipse. But, you know, I, I tend to agree with what Warren Wiersbe says. It was a supernatural act of God. And Warren Wiersbe said the darkness of Calvary was an announcement that God's firstborn and beloved son, the Lamb of God, was giving his life for the sins of the world. It was an announcement, a supernatural thing from God that, that this happened. It wasn't some anomaly of science. It wasn't some freak of nature. It was an act of God. Uh, the darkness at the, from the 6th to the ninth hour. And then at the ninth hour is when all of this was occurring, Jesus cried out, being forsaken, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the bystanders even then did not understand what he was doing, did not understand what was happening. And, you know, some of them said they supposed that he was calling Elijah because he said, Eliah, Eliah, uh, not Elijah, mind you, but he said, Eloi, Eloi, Lima, you know, they thought he was calling for Elijah. He wasn't calling for Elijah. He was calling out to God, you know, at this moment when God had turned from him. And if you think about this, it was a darkness, this thing that death was coming. And something I had never really thought about until uh, someone mentioned it in one of the commentaries I was reading. It says, if you notice... Jesus always calls him Father up to this. My God, I, I, you know, calls him Father. But here he says, my God, instead of Father. And he says, because in this moment in time, he was not presenting himself as the Son of God, but he was presenting himself as a sacrificial lamb for humanity. That brief moment of time, and it's something that we can't understand, Daniel Akins said, you, we can't understand how God the Father and God the Son pulled apart all because at this moment for just the briefest moment, whereas we re realize and understand that the Trinity is forever formed together, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and though these three are one. How can the three be one and then be separated? Again, a supernatural act of God because it was required for Jesus to be the sacrificial lamb for you and me. And that's the reason he was calling my God, presenting that sacrifice in my place and in your place, pre coming before him, bearing the sins of the world in my place and in your place. And he, that's why he called out. And he says, and then he breathed his last. They, they were some, they wanted to give him this is said sour wine. Some say that one of the things that they gave at that, that time was often, and I mentioned it last week, it was wine uh, mixed with myrrh. It was a painkiller. It was relaxant. Sometimes they gave them this mix with it strong enough that it actually sped the death really quickly in order to keep them from suffering any longer. You know, if they wanted them to die quickly for some reason. But you know they were saying no no let's let, let's not speed this along let's not let's not lessen his suffering let's see if elijah comes you know these people these people standing there were still looking for some supernatural act and they were they were missing all the supernatural things that god was doing they were looking for something from a human standpoint and at this moment it says and the curtain of the temple was torn in two and I want you to, these last three, ver, uh, last four uh, words in this, you might think, well, from top to bottom, big deal. Very important symbolically, because who did the tearing? It was God that tore this open from heaven to earth 
God made that way. It wasn't mankind. It wasn't us that grabbed it and ripped it and opened it up so that we would have the pathway to heaven. It was God that provided that and ripped it open to give us that pathway to heaven. Because in up until this point, only through going through the priest and through the sacrifices and through the holiest of holies and all of these things, God is saying right by ripping it in that way, saying, I'm opening a way for you to get to me. And it's through the sacrificial death of my son, Jesus. That's, you know, and, and to, if you look at that and you see those four little words and think, you know, they're, they're not much, but they're so, so very important. And it says, and when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. Now, this centurion, a Roman soldier, a man used to violence, used to power, used to things that, that you would think, you know, those were the things that opened his eyes. Those would be the things, you know, the power would be the things that would impress him. But it was the humility and the sacrifice and, and the grace and mercies in which Jesus did, died. And you think about that. Uh, it was not all the miracles that he had performed, not, you know, the walking on the water, not the raising of the dead, not the feeding of the thousands, not uh, uh, the healing of the woman with the issue of blood, not any of those things, but the fact of his humility and his grace and his love for humanity and his death that this centurion saw in him the same thing that that... A uh, thief on the right saw in him, saw that loving, merciful Messiah. And, you know, we, we need to understand that, that it's not through our strong will and not through our great arguments, but it's through our love, our love in teaching the gospel, our love in preaching the word, our love in doing the things that God has called us to do that people see and understand and come to believe. And when he died, he says, there were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the younger and of Joseph, and Salam. When he was in Galilee, they followed him, ministered to him, and there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. But when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage, went to Pilate, and asked for the body of Jesus. These women, it wasn't all of his disciples. It wasn't all of these apostles that were there. It, uh, it was all these women who uh, had such a, a pure love for Jesus that, and, uh, that were there, that were there looking on, that were there with him during this time. And then in Joseph of Arimathea, who was of the council, or the Sanhedrin, he was one of those who, it is said, that did not agree with the death of Jesus. So he was, he said, a respected member of the council who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God. It took courage. Think about what courage it took for him to go against all the other council members, for him to go to Pilate and ask for the body of Jesus. You know, something that, that it wasn't a common thing. Quite often, they left the bodies up there to rot. Quite often, you know, although this was a Jewish thing and the Jews uh, said, you know, that, that they needed to have a proper burial, that they needed to be down before the Sabbath, couldn't be hanging there during the Sabbath. But under Roman rule, Jesus could have hung there, the birds could have eaten his flesh, and he could have rotted on the cross. But Joseph wanting to give him a proper burial, a the, the honor that he deserved, asked for him and, and took and got his body. And it says Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. And summoned the centurion and when he found out that he was already dead, gave him to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud or a linen cloth, a grave cloth, which were expensive when you consider linen. It was an expensive thing. But Joseph was a man of means, and he wanted to honor Jesus. He wrapped him in it, put him in his own tomb. So it would be in a tomb cut out of a rock, which was, you know, normally tombs were just caves, just, you know, 
things like that were found. Yeah, you had to be somebody to have one cut out, to have one prepared. And when it was done, then a, a stone was rolled in front of it, and the two Marys were the only ones that were there and that saw him, saw where he was buried. And, you know, all of this took place <clears throat> so that when you look at Isaiah 53, 9, so that it might fulfill this prophecy, and it says, And they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. And these things uh, happened not because, you know, it, it happened in order to show forth what Jesus, you know, was fulfilling the prophecies. And, and in finishing up, I have a something I want to read that I think is just because when we, if you read that part, you know, this was Friday and it is all depressing. It's all, you know, something that you would look at and say, you know, there's nothing hopeful in all of this. He died. You know, if we, we think about it, his apostles, they went and scattered. They went and left. You know, they were, they just went back. They didn't know what to do. So they went there, but, this is just Friday, but I read this excerpt from a sermon. Uh, it was from, as he was de uh, described as a very passionate African-American pastor that lived from like 1913, died in the year 2000. It was uh, a part of a sermon that uh, Pastor S.M. Lockridge preached, and the title of it was Sunday's a Coming." And I can, and I told Brenda when I first read this thing, it sent chills all over me because I could just see this pastor up there passionately proclaiming these words. And I want to read it to you, and I want you to listen to this as as we finish up this uh, study this time right here. Sundays are coming, and it says it's Friday. Jesus is praying. Peter's a sleeping. Judas is betraying but Sunday's coming. It's Friday. Pilate's struggling. The council is conspiring. The crowd is vilifying. They don't even know that Sunday's a coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running like sheep without a shepherd. Mary's crying. Peter's denying, but they don't know that Sunday's a coming. It's Friday. The Romans beat my Jesus. They robe him in scarlet. They crown him with thorns, but they don't know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. See Jesus walk into Calvary, his blood dripping, his body stumbling, his spirits burdened. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The world's winning. People are sinning. Evil's grinning. But Sunday's a coming. It's Friday. The soldiers nailed my Savior's hands to the cross. They nailed my Savior's feet to the cross. Then they raised him up next to criminals. Sunday's a coming. It's Friday. Let me tell you something. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. The Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved, but they don't know it's only Friday. Sunday's a coming. It's Friday. He's hanging on the cross, feeling forsaken by his father, left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, it's Friday, but Sunday's a coming. It's Friday, the earth trembles, the sky grows dark, my king yields his spirit, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday, hope is lost, death is won, sin is conquered, Satan's just a laughing. It's Friday, Jesus is buried, a soldier stands guard, a rock is rolled into place, but it's Friday. It's only Friday, Sunday is a coming. Church, aren't you glad that when all of the things that we have here, Sunday's coming, that when we face all the, the trials and tribulations and the heartaches that we face in here, that day is coming. You know, we should uh, not be discouraged, but we should be encouraged. We should be encouraged in the fact that when Jesus hung on the cross and they all thought that, you know, Everything was lost. There was no hope. There, uh, the, the, we have been defeated. He is, the victory is gone. Sunday is a coming. And church, we know we just got through celebrating a few weeks back. 
what that Sunday commemorates. That Sunday commemorates the fact that when he walks out of the tomb, in church, because of the fact that he walked out of the tomb, we don't have to worry about death. Because even when death finds us, life's a coming. And the Bible says that we know that we have passed from death into life because we have love for the brethren. We know that, that we have passed from death into life. Our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life because we have believed in our heart, confessed in our mouth, and, and that Jesus Christ is Lord. If you think about that, the, these that were standing around there, the thief hanging on the cross beside him, the centurion uh, who professed the fact that this is the Son of God. They confessed. And church, if you've confessed, you don't have to worry about Friday because Sunday's coming. You don't have to worry about death because resurrection's coming. You don't have to worry about Satan because he is defeated and doesn't even know it. Uh, uh, church, we need to understand that victory is assured through Christ Jesus. And in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be in the last chapter of the book of Mark. And that's when we begin to celebrate the victory. That's when Mark begins to show us the fact that, yeah, all these horrible things occurred uh, on Friday. But thank God for Sunday. Thank God that that day came. And my prayer is today that you place your hope in that resurrected Savior, that you trust Him as your Lord and Savior, and, and know that, Death's coming to all of us. The Bible says it is once appointed unto man to die. And after this cometh the judgment. But aren't you glad that if you are a child of God, that if you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, if your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, that when you stand there, Jesus will look to the Father and say, the cross paid for it all. I paid for their sins. I paid their debt. And We'll hear those words, enter in, my good and faithful servant. It's good to be with you tonight, church. It's exciting. I, I tell, told Brenda, I said, I would love to have heard this sermon in person. I can just imagine uh, the excitement of this pastor because even just reading the words gets me excited. And, and you know, you, everybody that has ever heard me realize I get excited. But church, it isn't the fact that victory is assured through Christ Jesus, something to be excited about. We need to live as an excited people. We are a victorious people. We're not uh, uh, defeated. We have the victory through the blood of Christ Jesus if we are professing followers of Jesus. The Bible said that we should deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Him. And my prayer is tonight that you have denied yourself taken up your cross and follow Jesus. And if not, church, I beg you, please, just humble yourself. When the Lord, when, when His Spirit knocks on your heart's door, when He calls you and tells you that you need to come to Him uh, and submit and surrender your life to Him, that you would do that. I ask you, pray with me tonight. Pray for those that, that God is dealing with. Pray for those that are fighting these battles in this life. Pray that, that we as God's children would, would live in the assurance that Sundays are coming. Join me as we pray. Father, as we come to the close of this time, I want to praise you, Lord. God, I just want to praise you and thank you and glorify you, Father, for the fact that Sunday is a coming. Lord, that even though Satan thought that he had conquered, even though he thought Lord, that, that Jesus was gone, even though the Pharisees thought they had gotten rid of him, Lord, when Sunday came. God, he walked victorious out of that tomb. And Father, because he walked victorious out of there, Lord, we can also. God, through and by the blood of the Lamb, God, we have been redeemed, and Lord, we praise you for that. God, I pray that you would help us to live in that assurance, that we would live in that, and God, that we would be a people that tells the world, that would shout it from the rooftops, Sundays are coming, be ready. Lord, we love you and praise you again. ask you to be with our sick. ask you to be with Jackie, with Libby. ask you to be with Wiley's family. And God, more than anything, I pray, Lord, that you would be magnified, be glorified, and be honored in all that's said and done. And all of these things we'd ask in Christ's glorious name. Amen. Love you, church. God bless you. Thank the Lord for you. 
See you on Sunday. Invite everybody you can to come out and be with us on Sunday morning. God bless you.